leadership is a pretty hot topic right now. I think you hear people more and more saying that they're concerned about leadership in, in just about every facet of uh, be it political or business or large institutions and the like, there's questions that are raised about uh, leadership. You know, some people are wondering if there's another Abe Lincoln around that we can take out of the bullpen to help us with some of the issues that we have now. Uh, a person who I thought was the greatest leader in the history of this country. Uh, I think um, I'd start by pointing out that leadership is not based on techniques. Um, there's plenty of books out there on it, but it's much more personal than that. Um, Leadership, when practiced correctly, is really a flowering of the best of our human traits. The best of our human traits. And you find people who talk about uh, what's going on in this country right now, and uh, we hear some of them talking about the fact that they don't believe there's any heroes around anymore. Uh, those people are cynics. Uh, the def my definition of a cynic is a person who doesn't have any heroes. Um, <laughs> Frankly, um, heroes still exist. There's plenty to go around. Uh, the fact is that we're all more than we seem. And if you get a chance to uncover what people are about and what they do, um, you'll, you'll see that this country is still saturated with heroes. Uh, I had an uncle who died three months ago, um, and he fought in World War II. And after he died, I found out that he had won two silver stars three bronze stars and three purple hearts. Never said a word about it. Um, they're, they're every place we live, they're every place we go. And, uh, and the reason that that's good news is because there'll never be a shortage of heroes because there's plenty of heroes in waiting, as I call them. Uh, we all have the opportunity to do it. Uh, and the really nice thing about heroing is that we're all completely equipped to do it. We're just waiting for our opportunity. Uh, the other thing that you find, of course, particularly if you're in an organization, is that we judge people so often by what they do in the company they're with. And we kind of think that's their entire universe. I used to write letters to the employees here when I, was, when I was here. And I wrote one about Ben Hogan when he died, who, of course, was a golfer. And I get back and, and, and I sent out a picture of him, and I get back a note from a woman who works in our office in Uppsala, which is just outside of Stockholm. And she's telling me how much she appreciated the picture. She didn't know anything about golf, but she was the goalie on the world champion women's water polo team. <laughs> this woman was a world champion, and she was in the data department in, in Uppsala. It was just extraordinary. I mean, they're everywhere. And as I said in my book, um, if you're looking for heroes, they're usually no further away than uh, the cubicle next to yours or the house next to yours or in your own house as well. Um, it, it really is true, I think, that we're all more than we seem and, um, and, and recognize that fact. When I was talking to people upstairs, I was pointing out that leaders possess a deep-seated humility. Uh, as I said up there, humility really is the, the sire of all other virtues. And you'll never meet a great leader who's not humble. Uh, you'll meet people who got pretty high in organizations, uh, but they don't share um, in that humility. Um, Steinbeck in East of Eden said that all of us have a small slice of humility. Well, you get great leaders and they have more than a small slice. They have most of the pie. Uh, and as I was uh, uh, pointing out uh, when I was upstairs in, in, in that regard, um, it's something that some people view as a weakness because people look humble, but it's not true. Uh, it really is a sign of strength to be able to uncover and take a responsibility for our own shortcomings, which is, is something that is a hallmark of, of humble people. And I think in our day and age, when we see some of the problems that we've had, uh, we recognize the flip side of it, and that's arrogance. Um, when you look at some of the people in the business world several years ago and some of the issues that we had, um, it's people who just don't think that the rules that we live by apply to them, for whatever reason that they got to that point. Uh, I was reading something that said uh, some of these people suffered from unrestrained materialism. Well, I don't do well with terms like that. I mean, we know what they were suffering from. It was garden variety greed. Uh, these are people who just thought it took a little more, a little more. 
There's a story about John D. Rockefeller, the, the old man, the, f the first, the, the guy who really made all the money. And he was one of the richest men in the world, and he's being interviewed by this um, reporter. And the reporter said, Mr. Rockefeller, you are one of the richest people in the world. What is it going to take? How much more do you need to be happy? And he smiled and said, just a little more. <laughs> just a little more. And that's what we've seen, I think, with these people and the issues uh, that have um, uh, come about. Uh, somebody talked about something a moment ago uh, when they were speaking before about leaders and self-awareness. And this really is a very powerful uh, notion. Uh, because unless you are self-aware, truly self-aware, and understand your own shortcomings uh, in relationships, in relationships where you're trying to build trust, you'll always find the shortcomings in the other person. It's like the blame always falls on them. And I've always been pretty good at that. You know, I've probably practiced it more than you have. But I do think that it's something to think about. Uh, I, I, it's reflexive. You know, unless you really take account of yourself to blame the other person. Um, I was reading this story about this issue. There's a man in a uh, hotel room. His wife's asleep. He's just come out of the shower. He's stark naked. He decides he's going to get the paper in the hall, but he doesn't put any clothes on. So he's doing that deal, you know, like holding the door while he's trying to reach the paper. The door slips shut. Now he's out in the hall. So he takes the paper and makes kind of a dress out of it and goes down to the lobby to get a key to get back in the room. Now, he had been banging on the door. I forgot to tell you that. But his wife is one of these women who, or men that could sleep through an A-bomb. So he comes back with the key with his little paper dress, goes in the, who's he mad at? Who's he blame? His wife. He blames his wife for him going out in the hall stock naked to get the paper. It's something that happens time and again, and I think if the fella had used just a little bit of self-awareness, that wouldn't have happened. I thought I'd show you someone else who spoke on this, Chris Lowney, which I thought it, this was a wonderful statement, and he said, a leader's most compelling leadership tool is who he or she is. A person who understands what he or she values and wants, who is anchored by certain principles, and who faces the world with a consistent outlook. And I think that's exactly right. I think those are what people, that is self-awareness. That is truly self-awareness and something we need to practice.